he, he, he said a lot of things that you wouldn't want me to repeat about you in Chicago. And he things about me, you know that. I didn't give a damn about them. Well, I know it, but he's in Paris, and let's let him stay there. Okay, before we get started, I want to let you know about the new Patreon site for My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, where you can help support the podcast. Now, what's your reaction? Then also get a special episode. It's at patreon.com slash mhcbuyp. Those are the letters for the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast. All right? mhcbuyp. What else can we say? Special episode called Drafting Johnson, which is about the 1968 convention and also about Lyndon Johnson's withdrawal speech in the beginning of the election year. Yes, he said that he was withdrawing from the presidential election. Does this point have any appeal to you? But we discussed lots of evidence that Lyndon Johnson was at minimum very involved and possibly wanted that nomination. Give a listen to that and support the program at the same time. How about that? Now, what's your reaction? Images laid out before us, stark and definitely alive. A boy in cotton clothes, black with soot, hands in his pockets, metal trinkets fastened to his hat. An employee of the Turkey Knob Mine in West Virginia. Now girls smiling in flowered dresses, hand in hand. Friends. But behind them, the giant loom that they spend most of their time on. The loom that towers over another girl. In the middle of the photograph we see hopeless against the rows of machine. Tiny. You've seen that one before. It's the textbook photo for a past of working American children. Another one. Boy with his hands against his hips. Looks at the camera defiantly. Challenges us. He's worked four years in a mill in South Carolina, a veteran employee. We see another group of boys and girls so young that they must stand up on the spinning loom to mend broken threads. We fear for their safety as we watch. Serious-looking doffer boys, fast racers, who would replace spindles in the loom. They give us a pose so adult. Look us right in the eye. They stand together. A girl in ponytails. She's 51 inches high and works so long in her mill, she tells the photographer she can't remember her age. We flick through. Another one. The back roper in the mule room, controlling the movements of the loom. At Chase Cotton Mill in Burlington, Vermont. His name is Bo, and he can't be more than nine. All of them captured in a flash of magnesium powder and through a large wooden box reflected onto a sensitive glass plate. They live. They breathe. Maybe talk to us in film, on paper, magazine gloss, and now in pixels a century after they lived. In a sense... Through the photos we see, they live a life more full than what likely they got. The tiny girl with a hood on to protect her from the baking sun, with a bag picking fruit. A helpless thing of four feet carrying a box of hay upon her head. A bowling alley boy. Not there for fun. He's setting the pins well past midnight. While a tiny tot blacks boots in the bowery. A group out past midnight sells papers. An eight-year-old hawks on Philadelphia streets in sun or rain. The caption tells us he's passed his second bout of pneumonia. In Washington, D.C., a boy is sleeping on the stairs beside his papers. Little derbies and suspenders run around a lumber yard holding broad pieces. They smile. We see three boys on a moving train holding their shovels, proud like sentries. <laughs> 
a barefoot child with round cheeks, a soiled checkered shirt, and an apron. A fisherman's cap on his head. He holds a basket in each hand. His name is Manuel, and at five years old, he's a veteran shrimp picker. Behind him is a pile of shells, the product of the Biloxi Seafood Cannery. The photographer who brings these images to us is Louis Hine. His weapon, a potent one, arguably stronger than any of the inspectors, any of the soapbox orators, or the arm of the law at his time. Hind visits factories, mines, mills. He's never invited. He sneaks in, and with his heavy equipment and noisy old method, he snaps pictures of what's going on. Of what, in many cases, the enforcement authorities of the states where he's operating in don't know or don't care to know that it's going on. He's aware of what he's doing, that it's as much propaganda as anything else written or taken with a photograph. As Hein once said years later, photographs never lie, but liars do photograph. He travels all over the United States, but he finds little difference in these subjects. He sneaks in. To get that shot of Manuel, he brings a rowboat to the cannery dock in Biloxi. He asks his subjects in speech or in pantomime for permission to take pictures. He asks for no pose. He wants to preserve the dignity of these small workers. Progressive reformers, around the turn of the century, pushing a concept of laws to prevent what these photographs show, children from working. They hire Hein to snap photos and document the struggle, document what's going on in factories, mills, mines of America. You've no doubt seen many of them. There's a postage stamp featuring a girl at a loom. And some of the photos are key photos in textbooks that describe a practice of the past. They're products of an outdated time, anachronisms that do not sit well with modern times and values. When you're a high school student looking at your textbook, it's particularly jarring because you know that that young person didn't get the kind of American opportunity that you have reading the textbook. Hine and the other reformers got laws. They eventually got some enforcement. Eventually got centralization of laws, but they did something else. They changed some fundamental concepts in a way that still is debated today, angrily debated in some of our internet debates. None of this change is that long ago. The fundamental change in what we accept now for children and the photos of Hine is not 100 years ago. It's barely 75. The 1900 census records that 2 million children, this is 3% of the population, are working in mills, mines, fields, factories, stores, and on city streets. And likely, it's an undercount. They're feeding the machines, carrying shovels, holding flashlights, holding lamps, toiling on farms, putting items into boxes, handling inventory, hawking cigarettes and fruit, delivering messages late at night. Newspaper boys out on the street, extra, extra. We're accustomed to this image, right? But these boys would be young. As young as seven or eight in Colorado, 10 in Connecticut, 12 in Utah, and sometimes working late into the night because at this point, the newspaper has late editions and early editions. And these are how they're distributed. Connecticut, even, at its major newspaper's behest, lowered the age so that women of 10 can also hawk papers along with the boys. 
7% of children work, according to that census, and it's likely an undercount. There's a story written by Jack London in 1906. It's called The Apostate. And it starts out with a little scene, and a child named Johnny is in his bed. The mother says, if you don't get up, Johnny, I, will, I won't give you a bite to eat. And he doesn't want to wake up, and the mom says, come on. It really seems like a typical story of a young boy and his mom just pushing him, you know. Leave me alone, he says. But you start to see clues that something's not right here. The mother really has to yank him out of the bed. He's just very, very, very tired. And it's still dark outside. He rises, sits down, eats a piece of bread, some weak coffee, cold piece of pork. And all the while she's saying, you'll be docked, you'll be docked. He slurps down the coffee, some unchewed pieces of bread. The mother explains there's no more because he's got brothers and sisters. While they're talking, there's a loud shriek that comes over them, and it's the factory whistle. They rush out, and it's dark. Here's what London writes. In the factory quarter, the doors were opening everywhere, and he was soon one of a multitude that pressed onward through the dark. As he entered the factory gate, the whistle blew again. He glanced at the east. Across a ragged skyline of housetops, a pale light was beginning to creep. And London lets you know that this is the only bit of light that our Johnny will be seeing today. He took his place in one of the many long rows of machines. Before him, above a bin filled with small bobbins, were large bobbins revolving rapidly. Upon these, he would wound the jute twine of the small bobbins. The work was simple. All that was required was celerity. The small bobbins were emptied so rapidly, and there were so many large bobbins that did the emptying, that there were no idle moments. He worked mechanically. When a small bobbin ran out, he used his left hand for a break, stopping the large bobbin at the same time with thumb and forefinger, catching the flying end of twine. Also at the same time with his right hand, he caught up the loose twine end of a small bobbin. These various acts with both hands were performed simultaneously and swiftly. Then there had come a flash of hands as he looped the weaver's knot and released the bobbin. There was nothing difficult about weaver's knots. He once boasted that he could tie them in his sleep. Now London is very clever here. We are revealed things in small doses. And a specter visits this loom and thinks, Johnny is too young. He lies about his age, says he's 14. The inspector then says it's likely that Johnny has the rickets, skinny little legs. The inspector never stops him, just simply makes his comment to the factory owner. We're now made aware that Johnny's been working a long time. So London writes, Machinery had almost been bred into him, and at any rate, he had been brought up on it. Johnny, born with the pounding, crashing roar of the looms in his ears, drawing with his first breath the warm, moist air that was thick with flying lint. He had coughed that first day in order to rid his lungs of the lint. And for the same reason, he coughed ever since. At seven, he went into the mills, winding bobbins. When he was eight, he got work in another mill. But when he was nine, he lost his job. Measles was the cause of it. After he recovered, he got work in a glass factory. It was simple work, the tying of glass stoppers into small bottles. At his waist, he carried a bundle of twine. He held the bottles between his knees so that he might work with his both hands. Thus, in a sitting position and bending over his own knees, his narrow shoulders grew humped and his chest was contracted for ten hours each day. This was not good for the lungs, but he tied three hundred dozen bottles a day. Our time doesn't allow a complete telling of London's story. It's available on the web, The Apostate, Jack London. But I'll say this, eventually Johnny's who is a model childhood employee at the factory, will get sick. And even after he's better, he's so tired that he simply refuses to go to work. It's a work of fiction, but its author, Jack London, was not really writing fiction. He knew exactly, exactly of what he wrote. He worked a number of odd jobs during his childhood years, 
delivering papers, sweeping saloon floors, setting up pins in a bowling alley. At 14, he worked in a cannery where he spent 12 to 18 hours a day stuffing pickles into jars, 10 cents an hour. London's going to get out of this, helped a little bit by the proximity of where he was, San Francisco and Oakland, to the water, becomes an oyster pirate. And then he's actually hired by California to watch out for oyster pirates. Comes a sailor, unsuccessful gold miner, and eventually a writer, where he makes his craft. Um, the odd thing is that when he wrote The Apostate, Women's Home Companion paid him $767 for it. It would have taken young Jack London, working in the cannery, nearly 8,000 hours of cannery work to earn the same amount that he did as Jack London, the famous writer. And, of course, we must say, not every boy working grew up to be a London. There are, throughout American history, some voices raised against this practice. And there are a few actors in this area. And it comes along with the change that causes it. See, you know, it was very common in colonial times in early America for children to work in the farm with their family or for children or very young boys to be an apprentice. But this practice is very different after the Civil War, the industrialization of America. There's a different attitude. Here's what the Smithsonian says uh, on their site about child labor history. For children to work was nothing new. Even very small children had been expected to labor alongside their parents or as an apprentice. That system broke down by the time of the Civil War. A cobbler's apprentice in the old days eventually learned every step, from piece of leather to completed boots. But a young worker in a shoe factory now might spend her childhood doing nothing but positioning a heel to a nail done by a machine over and over again. Being a factory worker was a completely different story from being an apprentice. As industrial laborers, children received only money in exchange for their work, and very little money at that. They worked in crowded, noisy, impersonal, and often polluted surroundings, often subject to the authority of someone they hardly knew. There's a description on the same site of work in a cannery which was a common practice. A cannery day began early, usually around 2 a.m. It was common for six- and seven-year-old boys and girls to work all day alongside their parents. Payment was on a piecework basis. Children were paid at the same rate as their parents, but usually earned less because they couldn't do as much. In a seafood cannery, a child might be able to shell one or two four-pound pots of oysters a day while his parents could fill eight or nine. As the children worked, oyster shells piled on the ground around their feet, making it exhausting just to keep footing. The jagged shells cut their fingers. Shrimp were even worse, because they exuded a substance so corrosive that it ate into the leather of the worker's shoes, and even right into the cans in which the shrimp were packed. Workers would soak their hands in a loom the end of the day to try to toughen up their skin as protection. The shrimp were also packed in ice, making it even more painful to handle them for long periods. You have a few voices speaking out against this. And it first starts in the north in New England and Massachusetts, where there's a large number of mills. The National Trade Union's convention, meeting in 1836, proposes state laws for factory works, and limits on the age of the workers. The Working Man's Party, meeting in 1876, proposes a prohibition on employing children under 14. The American Federation of Labor, meeting in 1881, calls for the same. Samuel Gompers is able to ban cigar-making in tenements in New York. This is where many children were employed. So by banning it in the tenements, they were able to force it into shops where at least it could be regulated. All of these steps were genuine, but also had a dual motive. Reducing the number of children working, but also hoping 
to bring wages up for the adults that could work by eliminating the competition. It is in 1892 when the first National Party platform mentions child labor. And the Democratic Party of 1892 calls for a ban on children under 15 working in factories. They call for a state ban for states to enact the laws and do not commit to such a program themselves. In fact, in 1892, Grover Cleveland is elected president. The Democrats win the House and Senate and do nothing to enact such a ban. Massachusetts is the leader in states legislating against child labor. They have a long-standing rule that children under 15 need to be in school at least three months a year. That school can be near the factory. And in 1842, Massachusetts limits children to 10 hours per day. 1848, Pennsylvania bans workers who are age 12 or lower. In 1893, the state of Illinois bans factory work for children whatsoever. But in both of these states, it's not enforced. In Pennsylvania, it's not until the 1890s that an inspector is established to enforce the 1848 rule. Florence Kelly is an activist in Chicago and... As a child, she visits a glass shop. She sees children running about dealing with dangerous glass. Some of them are transporting bowls of acid all around the factory. As she reaches her 20, she becomes an activist and helps get that Illinois law passed. She builds a name for herself such that the governor of Illinois, Peter Atgold, a radical, some say socialist, we ran on a Democratic ticket, but... uh, some say socialist governor, appoints her as chief factory inspector of Illinois. This is a position that didn't exist before. It's a shocking appointment because Florence Kelly is a woman and has just become factory inspector for the state. She writes a book, Our Toiling Children, which emphasizes the problem of child labor and how pervasive it is and how little enforcement of the laws that there are. Then she establishes a white label program. Clothes made with the white label are made in good conditions. Those without it can't verify. So establishes the National Consumer League, voluntary boycott of factories using child labor. This is the beginning of the publicity that will attract a lot of attention and in a lot of states across the country is seeing demands on the legislatures for laws and there is demand at the federal level. It's new because we talked about, for instance, the 1892 platform of the Democratic Party about child labor and we mentioned that while it was revolutionary, uh, they didn't bring up anything that the federal government might do or they as a party might do, just that states should enact labor laws. What the Democratic Party does not do is bring up the issue of child labor in its 1896 platform, nor its 1900 platform. Republicans in 1900 pick up this plank, and they add a plank to their platform asking for a limit to child labor. No specifics. They are successful in the 1900 election and also do not enact such legislation. There's an interesting thing as you, you look through platforms and what the heck? I mean, on a uh, you know cozy winter Sunday afternoon, what better to do than read the 1888 platform of the Democrat and Republican parties? You see the change because... Going all the way back to the creation of the Republican Party, which we could say is the establishment of the two-party system, the 1856 Republican Party platform, the 1860, 1868, 1872, 1876, 1888, 1880, 1884, 1888, all the way up to 1892, there's no mention 
of the word child or children. And the same is true of the Democratic Party. Neither party's major platform mentions the word child or children at all. It is not in the scope of federal concern. The Republican platform in 1900 mentions, as we said, the raising of the age limit for child labor. The 1908 platform highlights that the Republican Party has adopted a labor statute for the District of Columbia, which then would have been, under the the thinking then, the only local area that the federal government had any say in, and to direct an investigation into the condition of working men and women. 1912, to limit effectively the labor of women and children, is in the platform in 1916. We favor vocational education, and rigid enforcement of a federal child labor law. By 1924, you have, again, the Republican Party stands for a federal child labor law and for its rigid enforcement. Flash forward to 1960. Kennedy is running on the Democratic ticket. The Democratic Party platform has 12 references to children or child. Nixon's 1960 GOP platform has 10 references to children or a child. Well, his future counterpart, George H.W. Bush, running for president in 1988. Now, the party's all about children and child. 52 references to children or child in the Republican platform. And the Democrats, 1988, have 19 references to children or child. Now, maybe in 1992, Clinton picked up on that because he amps it up, and there are 33 references to children in his winning campaign. What happened over the years is that a child became a concern of parties seeking control of the federal government. In effect, a federal concept of children was created by acknowledgement of some of the bad working conditions, the lack of enforcement from states, and the activism of many people in politics and in the press. In 1903, there's a bit of a spectacle that goes on, and that the activist, Mother Jones, organizes a children's crusade, and she takes working children from mines and mills and factories on a march from Pennsylvania to Theodore Roosevelt's house in New York, Roosevelt's now president. There are banners that these children hold that say, we want time to play. It's a very different time, and consideration of uh, publicity is a little different then. President Roosevelt refuses to meet with them. But this march, and a lot of the other activism, gets national attention, And by the turn of the century, you're going to see some state laws enacted about child labor. Indeed, Theodore Roosevelt rightly gets credit, especially being a member of the Republican Party, for actually introducing a lot of the progressive legislation in the United States that often Democrats these days champion. He gets some credit for taking on large trusts, for conserving land, enacting uh, the Food and Drug Act. This is not an area where you could rightly give Theodore Roosevelt too much credit in terms of child labor. And he does bring it up in one of his messages to Congress as legislation that he'd like to see. He does devote federal resources to studying the problem. The Republican Party did, as we mentioned, have a law limiting those under 15 from working in factories in the District of Columbia. But for the most part, and this is generally a weakness of Theodore Roosevelt, who as a president had many shrinks, he's not able to get very much through Congress. Congress is controlled by the conservative element of his party, and this is Joe Cannon, who has an absolute lock on the House of Representatives. And there's business interests influencing the Congress. Child labor legislation is not getting through Congress under Roosevelt. But there's progress, and, you know, 
some of the child labor reform committees that get started, the public having been spurred on by some of the horror stories, the photos, the various books, including Florence Kelly's books, pass some laws in states. And so by the time you get to, say, 1912, most states have laws in the books. Almost all of the states and territories have some kind of law or another relating to employment of children. But there's great variance in what states do. Alabama and Vermont set a limit on 12 years for manufacturing. Must be at least 12 years old. That was 15 in Texas or California. 14 years in Washington State or Arkansas. Most states treat employment differently depending on the industry. For instance, mines were a concern of a lot of state legislation. In Texas, you had to be at least 17 to work in a mine. Pennsylvania and Vermont said 16, though Pennsylvania allowed 14-year-olds to work around mines. They could still be involved in those jobs in processing coal, for instance, taking bits of imperfect material out of the coal bins, and thus still be exposed to some of the issues that coal miners face. In Alabama, you could work. Uh, in Alabama, you could work in a mine at 13. You had to be male. Pennsylvania put limits at 18 at blast furnaces. Washington State said 10 years old or more, begging, hawking goods, or playing a musical instrument in the streets. Many states banned minors from immoral work, such as being in a, a bar or saloon. Most states gave some consideration to night work. In fact, most states banned it. But states varied on what a night was. When did the night start? In Alabama, it was 7 p.m., Washington State, 8 p.m., California, 10, Pennsylvania, 9. New York split it up depending on the type of work. Night started at 5 p.m. for factories, 7 p.m. for service jobs, and 10 p.m. for newsboys. Limits on total hours per week varied state to state as well. It was 58 hours in Connecticut, 48 hours in New York, 58 if in service or hotel in New York. 48 hours per week in California, 60 in Alabama and Arkansas, and no limit on hours in Texas. So there's great variance between the laws that are on the books even 100 years ago. But the laws almost become of secondary importance because the real issue was enforcement. If you just look at the personnel and money available for enforcement, it varied a great deal, too. As of 1912, New York had 125 inspectors, one of the best. Alabama used the same single inspector for factories and jails, and they sent him around the state randomly four times a year checking out factories. Illinois relied on truant officers in the schools. Texas had one inspector and two assistants for the whole state. Indiana had 18 inspectors. This is what the National Child Labor Committee said about the states. Enforcement has lagged far behind legislative enactment. American people are prone to pass legislation without providing the machinery necessary to carry out their will. In 1911, for instance, West Virginia passes a law forbidding children under 14 at factories. Here's what the Child Labor Committee said. A visit to the state six months after the law finds them operating under the old one. They add this. An extensive study of the glass manufacturing industry made in 1910 and 1911 studied 29 plants in Ohio. At more than one-third of them, Children under 16 were working at night. More from the Child Labor Committee. Recently, in a spare hour, the writer rounded up 13 newsboys plying their trade in Albany, New York. Two of them were under 10 years old. 
The others were not wearing the badges required by state law. In New York, only 30% of employers that were found with violations were fined. Pennsylvania, less than 1%. And in West Virginia, none. Now, at the same time this is going on, in Great Britain, 4,000 violations of child labor were being enforced, and 95% were fined. So you're seeing less enforcement in American states and great variance between the states and even some of the states with good laws and a decent amount of inspectors weren't doing well. Hopes were raised high in one particular state where there was a lot of child labor going on. And it was said of Pennsylvania that there were more children toiling there than in all of the cotton south. And Pennsylvania has mines, it has steel mills, it also has some textile industries as well, and glass making, very big in, in Pennsylvania at this time. All of these industries involve children. It was commonly known that they involved children. So the legislature in 1903 passes a law trying to ban this practice and does provide some inspectors. And they put in charge of it former Civil War captain, John Delaney. Hopes are high because Delaney make some comments in the beginning that he really wants to rigorously enforce this and to improve the image of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania hires 39 inspectors. They make 48,178 visits to 16,589 establishments. This is considerable. More visits than most states are doing at the time. In other states, you'd get... You know, at a factory, you'd get a visit a year, and the factory manager knew full well that if an inspector came, it was probably a good year before he'd see an inspector again. So they could go right back to doing what they're doing. Delaney used repeat visits, and he focused on the industries that were known to employ child workers. Hosiery, Textiles, silk, cigar houses, glass, paper boxes. Now, he finds in all of these establishments 40,000 children under 16 at work and dismisses 3,000 illegal workers. And initially, the child labor advocates are excited about this, but here's what happens. He ends up prosecuting only 61 cases. The way Delaney enforces it, employers are not liable in Pennsylvania if they were lied to. And so it's very common for parents to falsify their children's documents, to say they're going to school when they're not, to say they're older than they are, for the states and counties that required someone to be physically present to get the certificate, they might send an older sibling and say that they were the younger siblings. So, according to Delaney, it's not up to the factory to sort that all out. This was not the case in all states. So, Pennsylvania ends up in 1907 finding 1,100 violations, prosecuting none. 1908, 716 violations, prosecuting just 32. In 1909, finding 783 violations and prosecuting none. 1910, finding 1,600, prosecuting 26. This record in Pennsylvania is decried by none other than Florence Kelly, since she was previously a factory inspector and well-suited to criticize the efforts in Pennsylvania. She said they were, Delaney's office offered meager and muddled reports, inspectors who were political cronies. There were inspectors who had no civil service protection. If they didn't have that, and they didn't do what Delaney liked, he could just fire them. He never went after hours at night. He just pursued the age of the children working at the factory and what tasks they were doing. 
when there were accidents at factories, his inspectors did not include the age of the person who suffered the industrial accident. So it took a long time uh, and a lot of criticism, but reformers were able to get Delaney replaced. In 1913, there's a new department in Pennsylvania, more inspectors, more prosecutions. Because of the variance in both law and enforcement, there's calls for federal legislation. And it's in 1960 when Woodrow Wilson signs the Keatings-Owens Act which bans interstate commerce where there are people employed at a factory that don't meet federal guidelines, and that is 15 years old or age or under are working there and a couple other conditions. It's progressive thinking legislation. Uh, There's a mechanism to enforce it. It's going because federal law is supreme. It's going to supersede any more lenient state laws. So, I think it's a good time to bring it up because Woodrow Wilson's under a lot of attack uh, lately. And some of it, of course, justified. I mean, modern history is certainly viewing Wilson's policy on race with more suspicion and with more criticism. And uh, there isn't much in the record for him to defend himself there other than his own personal feelings and intentions. He's kind of under criticism from the left and the right. I mean, from the right, it's more about the Federal Reserve and the buildup of the government during World War I, the increases made in the income tax during that time. Wilson's not responsible for creating the income tax. So he's an attack from left and right. And for a lot of people, I think they just shake their heads and say, well, you know, what good was he? And, you know, compare him to someone like Theodore Roosevelt and he doesn't look so good. Well, this is an issue where... I think credit is due to Woodrow Wilson for seeing that legislation was enacted and signing it. Unfortunately for Woodrow Wilson and those who passed the bill, the Supreme Court would rule Keating's Owings at that time unconstitutional. Here's what they said. Congress, they said, does not have the power to regulate the commerce of goods that are manufactured by children. Now, they drew a distinction between the manufacture of the goods and the regulation of certain goods themselves that might be inherently evil, like prostitution, lotteries, liquor going between states. The federal government can step in there. But when it comes to an item like cotton, which could be bad if a child was the one who made the product, or could be good if it was an adult that made the product, Congress had no right to step in. That was the interpretation of the law at the time. It was a strict state for rights holding. It was a narrow, narrow view of the Commerce Clause and the federal government's interstate uh, regulatory authority. Here's what they say. The grant of power of Congress over the subject of interstate commerce was to enable it to regulate such commerce and not to give it authority to control the states in their exercise of the police power over local trade and manufacture. In interpreting the Constitution, it must never be forgotten that the nation is made up of states to which are entrusted the powers of local government, and to them and to the people, the powers not expressly delegated to the national government are reserved. The Act is in a twofold sense repugnant to the Constitution. It not only transcends the authority delegated to Congress over commerce, but also exerts a power as to purely local matter, where the federal authority does not extend. Well, in this case, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes dissents, and he maintains Congress was completely within his right to regulate interstate commerce. Goods manufactured, Holmes said, in one state and sold in other states were by definition interstate commerce. The entire manufacturing process is under the purview of Congress, and this constitutional power could not be cut down or qualified by the fact that it might interfere with the carrying out of the domestic policy of any state. In other words, 
Government has a right to regulate interstate commerce, and the majority's argument is that if you do that, you might interfere with a right that a state has. Well, the federal government's never done that before. It's, its law is supreme. It doesn't yield its own authority that it has because it might interfere with a state's action. Many things the federal government do might not be very popular with the states. That doesn't stop them from exercising their full authority. The notion that prohibition is any less prohibition when applied to things now thought evil, I do not understand. To say that it is permissible as against strong drink, but not as against the product of ruined lives. If there's any matter upon which civilized countries have agreed, it is the evil of premature and excessive child labor. So said Justice Holmes. Unfortunately, it's going to be 30 years later, 1941, United States versus Darby Lumber, when the full right of the federal authority to intervene in cases such as a child labor violation would be established. To some degree, this is like beating up on a plastic bag, right? Because who's for child labor? I get that. So we should explore that there is another side to the story, however skeptical we might be of it. Once historical, if we look at the past, we owe ourselves the best context of the conclusions we're making. There were more children then. Children were 30% of the American population in 1900. Right, That goes down. 25% in 1960. Today, it's 21%. So given the greater representation of children in the population, you can make the case that you couldn't have all of them not working, or at least it's not as easy to do that as it might be today with a greater adult percentage of the population. It's also true that automation wasn't there. You didn't have the electric power. When I looked at the 1920s in a cast that we called The Dark Side of Booms, I talked about how the road crew was cut in half because of automobiles mechanical and electric power. The factory could be shrunk and illuminated. The staff there reduced. More productivity with less people. Well, in all of this from the 1920s forward, you were eliminating jobs there and eliminating certain type of little transportation within factories like runners, loaders, in the mines they called them, breaker boys. These are now automated to an extent. We even talked about in the 1920s cast how the creation of the school bus allowed more children to go to school, for that to be a reality for more, because you can have a school in one central location and get them there through the automobile. There's also an argument that children in that historical time, with low available income, low GDP that anyone was going to earn, their best chance for some of them was to at least make some money working. And... And this was a big argument made at the time. The children were gaining something from all that work. That argument's retained today, and it's not completely wrong. I think many children worked, became good at what they did. I think that some of the conditions uh, were troubling there. But if you look at that argument today, it still has some play. If, for instance, there was a movement to say 17-year-olds can't even work, I would say we might be babying, you know, so there are limits. I'd remember reading a Hendrick Smith book, The New Russians, and it's about his trips to the Soviet Union during the 70s and the 80s. And one of his Soviet friends there expressed a concern about his child not really having much ambition or direction and asked, like, well, what do Americans do? And, you know, Smith says, well, my child is 16 and he's, you know, he has a job on the side while he goes to school. And the Soviet parent just looked at that with a horrified look and said, oh, I could never do that. It just wasn't part of the culture, at least at that point in Russia, the Soviet Union. Their view is that Americans were greedy for doing this to their children. So I think we have to be careful to not infantilize teenagers and say that there's no possibility for them to work. I think we have a good balance with the laws we have, and it's the result of historical fights on this. We're not completely over either. We might think that the law is the same now as it say it was in the 1960s, or the culture is, in terms of 
children, teenagers working. But I think you see now a little bit more of an interest in aligning the teenage jobs to perhaps what children will be doing in college or what they might want to pursue as a career, where if you go back to the 1980s, there was an 1985 survey where 80% of teenagers said they were just simply working for the money. And that's probably the perception of those living at the time. But even that is, there's a little bit more emphasis now on trying to get a little more out of those teenage jobs, interns, study programs alike. So, you know, there's the side benefit, not just the cash, but the side benefit of working. Yet, I'm not totally satisfied by all of this, all these counter arguments. I mean, it's pointless, of course, to dwell on the past, especially to attack or to cry the past. The point is just to learn from it. Yet, I think that even with our modern view, it seems like child labor and fixing it seemed like something that took too long in the United States. In 1920, there's still one million children under 15 on the books working. I want to think that back then people should have made a different set of choices, that there should have been a force to intervene to help children where there was not. And it seems sad. Well, there was a group who tried. 1924, after we talked about the Wilson legislation, federal legislation on child labor is ruled unconstitutional, there's a push to then pass a constitutional amendment. And this one has some bipartisan support. There's opposition, though. For one, it's 1924. It just came out of World War II. There's a Red Scare. And the opponents are lining up child labor reform with communism. Here's Senator William King from Utah on the floor of the Senate. Every communist and socialist is behind this measure. The Bolsheviks in Moscow, he said, and the senator had recently taken a visit to Moscow. The Bolsheviks in Moscow know that there the federal government is taking over childhood from parents. Then you have the manufacturers, especially glass and textile, are still using a lot of children in these industries. And they're saying a couple of things. Usually short of defending child labor at this point in 1924, they're blaming parents. You know, it's the parents' fault. Just go after parents who are sending their kids to work and not working themselves. They're vagrants, and there's many state laws on the books. Just enforce them. That's one of the arguments. The other is, and this is the argument from James Emery, the National Association of Manufacturers, just kind of attacking the style of the child labor amendment. It seems to be written in a hostile manner instead of the kind of persuasion that's really going to lead to permanent change. So like, don't force us, help us, allow us to make the change, change gradually. So this is still the argument in 1924. But there's a point to this in what would be round one of that battle fought 90 years ago. These guys lost, at least the first round, they lost. Popular support was there. 1924, for banning child labor. The child labor amendment passed the people's representatives, the Senate and the House, overwhelmingly. In this case, support from the people's representatives, though, was not enough. The trouble is that it then goes to the states. And there, from 1925 to 1933, only nine states ratify the child labor ban amendment. There's a campaign against it. And it's a heavy one. It involves leaflets, grassroots. There's flyers that go around saying, you know, this amendment will tell you that no girl can wash dishes in your house. No boy can crank up your Ford. The legislation has absolutely nothing to do with that. But these are the kind of things that went around. There's a group, the Farmers States Rights Committee, that distributed leaflets that the child labor amendment would have the federal government on your farm. It turned out that the Farmer States Rights Committee was owned actually by a cotton miller and not a farmer at all. But the negative thoughts started to have an effect. There's Massachusetts, a state that has both sides. It's a, you know, not a north-south issue here because Massachusetts has some 
progressive politicians in the 1920s, but it's also loaded with textile mills. The legislature doesn't want to decide what to do about the amendment, says it to the voters to instruct them, and the people of Massachusetts vote it down three to one. There's a known end to the story of child labor in America, and an unlikely end for the story, actually, at the same time. The known end is that the New Deal and various laws, especially the Fair Labor Standard Act, new interpretation of the Commerce Clause under Darby Lumber by the Supreme Court. But the unlikely coup de grace that helps support these events is the Great Depression and the stunning amount of unemployment among adults that it brings. Adults who are out of work at the time, they want the children out of the factories so they can have those jobs. Manufacturers who normally would fight to maintain their right to pay children a low amount to get work out of them during the Depression, they can get all the adults they want to come to work if their shop is still open. Many of them are not open. They don't have much influence in the federal government during the 1930s. The unions do. Progressives do. They've always been against child labor. Here's what you see, too. Even at the state level, you, need, you get 20 more states to pass that child labor amendment between 1933 and 1938. You never get the three-fourths needed for passage. But it's not needed with New Deal legislation, which does pass and address the issue. Now, why look at this issue, children full of soot and textile dust, the real struggle to rescue them? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons why it's important to talk about. One is in the main point here is to point out that while we talked about how the American child labor story is in the past, from a world perspective, there is child labor today. We are wearing goods and using items that are a result of it. We should be aware of it and perhaps join the struggle to end it. It's not in the scope of what I'm talking about, though, to give too much more information on that. And it's not really my pro. It does need to be mentioned. I think in terms of American politics, there's a lot of debates about the historical progressives and today's libertarians and I don't think this issue solves all of those, but it might add some depth. In the United States today, and particularly on the internet, there's a good amount of what I would describe as absolute libertarianism. That any force on any person is trespass. Government should be extremely limited. And that the centralization and progressive laws, particularly those passed at the turn of the century, are under heavy Skeptical review right now by those who see maximum good and maximum solving problem in simply having freedom of action for all persons. Those individual actions will self-correct and adjust things accordingly. You have some of this on the left and the right because I think the tempting part of a very absolute libertarianism is things like, well, look at what the NSA did with our phones or look at what Colorado is doing with the marijuana laws while the federal government is still being big brother. And of course, we know the story on the right uh, regarding the laws and their view of, of, of them and taxes and, and strong government and the like. I think the story of this real problem that occurred in American history was that it was never sufficiently solved by the means that existed at the time, by the concepts that existed at that time. Individuals, starting with parents, sometimes made bad choices or had no choice to make. Then moving to the state level, states were unable to achieve what most Americans certainly now would want, but what most Americans at the time wanted, an end to the practice and enforcement, serious enforcement. Even where well-meaning, there was great variance between all of the states of the Union and what they did. Americans decided 
that they did not want to see their neighbor's children subjected to a life that, even where it wasn't dangerous, lacked opportunity because the learning years were cut off. In other words, it required that a group of people who wanted change not mind their own business and very much get involved. Libertarianism is not to be disregarded. It offers a useful critique, especially against extremes. I gave you, for instance, some examples of even where this clear-cut issue, child labor, does have another side. And where there might be, let's say, if a future Congress sets the age of working at 18, I might say that's troubling. Just simply have them at books and computers until 18? I think that would be troubling. So there's a, there's a useful critique there, useful things to think about. But I do think uh, when you consider history, you consider why certain structures exist, certain laws exist before abandoning them. There was a time when we tolerated children working and the free action of individual actors did not work well to save them. Factory owners and parents, sometimes inspectors and governments, obviously exploited them. We all know it's wrong. And we don't want it to happen at all in the future. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. If you do like the program, please tell someone about it. Thanks for listening.